Hello guys, Winston here. Ever since Autodesk University, where I met the Johns of the Business of Machining podcast, I've started thinking about the Shaboko platform in a different light. Though both Saunders and Grimsmo run very capable machine shops, they hinted at places where an extremely low-cost, high-speed CNC option might excel, in soft materials like foam. Could there really be a business case for a hobby machine in a professional shop? Is there a better option for cutting foam than on a Mori? Okay, maybe that's kind of overkill, like hunting squirrels with a howitzer kind of overkill. But your ROI for cutting foam on a traditional VMC is not great. And before some of you take this the wrong way, I love Grimsmo's work and I'm not trying to string him up like a case study. But I am curious about whether or not there exists a small niche in the commercial space where cheap gantry-style belt-driven router-powered machines might actually be a really good fit. So let's oblige my curiosity and see just what's possible on a Shaboko. To start off this experiment, I bought a variety of foams, some polyurethane examples and some polyethylene types. I have some pink anti-static polyurethane foam. This stuff is about 1.4 pounds per cubic foot, very light and very soft. Think sponge. I also have some 2 pound polyurethane. This is substantially more rigid, but still very compliant. Then I bought some 2 pound polyethylene foam, much more rigid and similar to what you'd find in a lot of consumer packaging, or pool noodles. And lastly, I bought Kaizen foam, that mythical stuff that's supposed to revolutionize how you organize. It's really just 1.4 pound PE foam that's been laminated. That lamination actually changes the way it cuts because the glue interface stands up to shear a lot better. So you can cut your tool organizers by hand with a knife, but you shouldn't because isn't that why we have CNCs? These samples cover a wide range of mechanical properties which I felt would give me a good basis for learning to machine foam. Now let's cover the tools. I'll be testing out three tools, only one of which is specifically for foam cutting. In the ring we have a quarter inch three flute end mill from Carbide 3D, fairly generic geometry, moderate helix, typical rake angles on the cutting edges. Also we have a quarter inch single flute end mill from X Edge Tools, much lower helix angle, super aggressive cutting edge. This one is meant for plastic so you really want to slice into the material and have generous room for chip evacuation. And last but not least, the legendary Datron Tools 5mm foam cutter. It's got super low helix angles, three flutes, and each one has an extra cut inside the outer edge that also sharpens up that rake angle. My recipe for these tests was around 200 inches per minute with a spindle speed between 25 to 30,000 RPM. Depth of cut was one times the diameter of the end mill and my work holding involved plastering the table of my Shaboko with double-sided tape. If you do this a lot, you've probably already invested in a good vacuum work holding setup. I'll be honest, I thought the results with anything less than a foam specific cutter were going to be complete trash. Ever since that linoleum cutting experience, I thought that soft materials would be horrendous to machine. My lack of experience led me to believe that standard geometries would just rip the foam and produce ugly results. And I was completely wrong. If you have a medium hardness foam and a generic end mill, you can actually get relatively clean walls and not a ragged embarrassing mess. That's right folks, go forth and cut foam with the cutters you already have. I guess that means I can just wrap up the video right here then. Except there are a lot more interesting nuances of foam cutting that I discovered in the course of my experiments. Let's start with where the Datron cutter shines. Actually, before we get to that, we need to talk about how you can even use Datron tooling because it's metric. This one has a 6mm shank, not quarter inch. Most collets have a compression range to accommodate a small variation in shank diameter. This is the safe range that you can crush them without permanently damaging them. On ER11 collets, it's about half a millimeter. On larger collets, it can be up to a millimeter, and this is partly dependent on the grade of steel used in the collet. I have no idea what specs these router collets are made to, but I do know that you probably shouldn't use a 6mm end mill in the DeWalt. The taper is so gradual that the nut bottoms out before the collet can compress the extra 0.35mm needed to hold a 6mm tool. The Makita still works though, so if you're not on Team Yellow, it actually works in your favor. But the best option is still to get a collet sized exactly for your application. Now we can see how the Datron cutter works. Take a look at the top edge in this polyurethane foam test. On the standard geometry cutters, there's a little more tear out at the top. With the Datron super shallow helix, the edge is a lot cleaner. And in fact, if you look up some other end mills, there are even some straight flute foam cutters out there. The foam structure of polyethylene lends itself very well to low helix angles. It's very similar to why upcutting end mills suck in plywood. Speed is another advantage. Very few other tool manufacturers test beyond 1 or 200 inch per minute feed rates. Datron, because they're Datron, are all about high speed. 
So Dan, who I met at AU and was a guest on my podcast, recommended that I start at 7 meters per minute with their cutter. 7 meters per minute translates to 275 inches per minute, which is blazing fast. It's actually faster than the Shapeoko's Gerbil speed limiter, which is set at 200 inches per minute by default. So if you want to go faster, you'll have to modify your Gerbil parameters via the command line to increase the allowable feed rates. I bumped up my limits by 500%. I ran a couple tests at max RPM and 275 IPM and it seemed to me that the cutter wasn't even struggling, so I went up to 400 inches per minute. But to really show the advantages of that kind of speed, you need to be cutting something larger, so I made a bigger test cavity to cut out on the Shapeoko. And here I started noticing strands of foam getting wound up around the end mill. This is what I'm calling the Grimsmoke conundrum, where normally you'd want long flowing tool pads, but in foam you can't, because these long continuous cuts form long continuous strands of foam. He got around it by using a cleverly oriented parallel toolpath to clear a long narrow cavity. But what happens if you have a massive pocket like this? As far as I know, Datron deals with it by using a ton of compressed air. But the downdraft from the router isn't nearly as precise or high velocity enough to guarantee that you'll keep the free end of the foam noodle from getting caught up around your end mill. My vacuum didn't help too much either. My solution is to use adaptive clearing in narrow paths. By using containment boundaries offset from the walls of my pocket, I can guide the toolpath in corridors that will trigger short adaptive arcs. I'm not using two-way because conventional cutting is better for wall finishes, but if you go the Grimsmo route and nail down your wall finishes first and rough out your cavity second, you might actually be able to get away with both ways adaptive clearing to speed this up more. The point of this little experiment is to find a foam cutting recipe that was reliable. It's not as fast as an unconstrained adaptive or regular pocketing operation, but I have a lot more confidence that this method will run to completion without constant nannying. And the last thing I want to talk about is soft foam, like the pink anti-static polyurethane I had. This was the most difficult foam to machine because of how soft it was. Even cutting it with a conventional toolpath, the deflection of internal features was enough for the foam to get snagged by the cutter. Usually it would just tear a chunk out of my stock, but during one test I had the whole piece rip off the table and wrap itself around the end mill, which was super scary. This is where the Datron foam cutter, which is actually specialized for polyurethane, really stood out, because it's a stub flute cutter. Only the bottom of the cutter will grab at the foam. A longer fluted end mill will cause a little foam deflection at cutting depth, which will cause more foam deflection above it, which will snag on a taller section of the cutter and cause more deflection, etc etc. It's a catastrophic chain reaction that's solved by putting flutes only where you want to cut. Also, in my testing, I found that if you want to cut internal features, they should be at least 3 quarters of an inch wide. I used this Carbide 3D logo as a test, and by varying my stock to leave parameter, I figured out the point at which the polyurethane foam was rigid enough to resist getting pulled into the cutter. Most people are not going to need to cut thin features in super soft foam, but if you do, be aware of this phenomenon. So I guess in conclusion, I have two takeaways. The first is pretty obvious. Yes, the Shapeoko is totally capable of cutting foam and at a pretty competitive speed too. I'm running 25% faster acceleration than stock at 500 millimeters per second squared, and there's definitely room to go faster, but I'm looking to maintain reliability on an open loop system, not set any records. This rather modest acceleration will still serve you very well. The second point is that while you can get away with using generic end mills, more specialized cutters will give you better finishes and help you work around material properties of foam at more extreme ends of the density and rigidity spectrum. So, if you want to step up your packaging game as a small shop or maybe kit out your drawers with some Kaizen, CNC foam milling on a desktop machine is a totally viable option. Just make sure your dust collection game is on point and be smart about your toolpath application. I want to thank you all very much for watching and thank Datron for providing the tooling for this experiment. I'll be back with more CNC projects soon.